Hi, everybody. How are we doing today? Feeling all right? Good stuff. Warm audience. Happy to hear it. <laughs> it is chilly in here. I'll give you that. My name's Daniel. I work for a company called Datadog. I'm with uh, developer relations over there. And it's my pleasure and honor to share the stage with this man right here. Hi there. Uh, welcome to reInvent. Uh, my name is Roberto. I work for Pirelli. I've been working there for the last three years as digital innovation lead. All right. That's us. Hey, we're amplified now. Excellent. So good afternoon. Um, I hope everyone is enjoying uh, reInvent. And I'm going to open up with a question. How many of you have been working for a company that is at least 10 years old? Your company your is hand. 10 years old. 10 years old. 20? 20 year old company? 50? 50 year old company? 100? Ooh. 146? 146 years old. Yeah, you put your hand back up. Nice. Well, <laughs> that's a pretty specific number. 146? Well, we have been around for 146 years. Pirelli has. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I've not been around for 146 years. <laughs> so you may have heard of Pirelli, um, and you may know that Pirelli is best known as a tire manufacturer. Uh, we have log a long legacy of inventions, patents, and technology, uh, historically centered about rubber and rubber products. Uh, tire specifically, but uh, in fact, uh, there is much more than that. Uh, believe it or not, the history of rubber is also a history of uh, technological revolution. Uh, everything from industry to automation and from automobiles to consumer products, Pirelli's been pushing the envelope every day, literally since the 1800s. Since the 1800s. Yeah. So today, we, this definitely means tires, but also uh, increasingly means tech in the way most people in the audience know, that is computers. Computers, right? It is reInvent after all. So there was a saying coined back in uh, 2013 that every company is a tech company. Right, you may have heard this, software is eating the world, right? And as I had the pleasure to learn from working with Roberto over the past few months on this presentation, Pirelli's no different, okay? Pirelli has always been a tech company in a lot of ways, right? But what does it mean to be Pirelli, a, a company that makes tires from a tech perspective in the modern world? So that, of course, means electric vehicles, but that future has already happened. Uh, now companies are working on uh, autonomous driving and connected vehicles in an ever-growing IoT ecosystem. Uh, consider how the idea of car ownership has evolved, uh, of the sharing economy and the services in that space. Speaking of sharing, what about entire fleets of vehicles sharing intelligence, making the road safer and more efficient for everybody? So when we say that Pirelli is a technology company, this is what we are talking about. It's good stuff. Um, when I say... When I say that Datadog is a tech company, that's probably a little bit easier to understand, right? Uh, we haven't been around as long as Pirelli, to be fair, but over the past eight, nine years or so, we've built, a, frankly, a pretty good monitoring and analytics platform. Uh, we've rolled out some really good products recently, like logging, reuser monitoring at a security product. I'm not going to get too far into it, but we, too, have been pushing the envelope technologically, just not since the 1800s. Uh, We've built a pretty good relationship, Roberto and I, in the same way that Pirelli and Datadog have actually built a pretty good relationship uh, over the past few years. And I'm actually, I'm honestly really glad to have had this opportunity to, to help share this Pirelli story with you. So this journey we're going to go on today over the next uh, 50 minutes or so, we're going to go through a bit about the Pirelli story, how they got to where they are today. Uh, we're going to be looking at you know, some cloud architecture. We're going to get into some cool IoT stuff. Uh, Roberto's promised that he's going to do a little dance on stage, so watch out for that. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. Are you ready? Yes. Here we go. So, yes, we are involved in tires. And when I say involved, I mean consumer car tires, motorcycle ones, uh, supply motorsports events, the major ones such as Formula One, and bicycles. You know, things that tires go on. Yeah. Right? Yeah, all right. So, in fact, there is a, mm, a lot more going on. Uh, it's more than just consumer products. Everything from digital advertising to our yearly calendar to our luxury design products to cultural and social commitments, we are involved in a lot of different activities. At the end of the day, our focus, in fact, remains tires, uh, with a strong commitment on making top quality products for prestige brands well known for their uh, super sport high-end models. Uh, it means there is a strong focus on quality and performance, uh, I know it might sound like a marketing statement, but a it's necessary to understand our context. 
To make our prestige products, we are working with clients that set the bar very high for us in terms of uh, uh, quality and expectations for innovative products. Uh, and as an organization, Pirelli needs to be at the cutting edge of technology, and that stuff being everything from rubber on the road all the way to the servers and apps that power the company. I like how we worked the title of the talk into the, that was very nice. Yeah. <laughs> So like every other company on Earth, prior to the invention of AWS, uh, we had servers and data centers running on-prem, uh, perfectly normal. And having said that, we still have a big part of our infrastructure running old school, but that does not mean we are not very active in the cloud commitment. And like a lot of companies, uh, we made a decision of uh, taking advantage of the cloud computing. It sounds like the same story, but of course, every company is different, and it's never really the same story, is it? Well, exactly. Every company is different, just like every person is different. Everyone's story is different. So everyone's journey to the next phase is going to be different. And when you think about it, it must have been, I don't want to say difficult, but there were some challenges for Ellie, right? How can you go from being a 140-plus-year-old rubber company, fundamentally, to being a modern tech company that just happens to make tires. Yeah. So we started thinking, could all our systems go to the cloud? We started thinking about that, um, assessing every single one of our resources in order to understand if moving to the cloud was the right choice. And not just the resources, these are business units, manufacturing processes, uh, stuff that impacts the real world. Um, and for a company of our size, scope, and history, that's a big, uh, very tall order. Uh, uh, indeed a tall order. And it would be for any company, but again, for 140 plus years, yeah. right, there's a lot of inertia there that has to be overcome, and, and that's normal. Uh, P.S. for the tech crew, uh, our timer never started. So just putting that out there, someone could fix that, that would be super duper. Okay. So... Historically, B2B, and in some countries still is, um, the main business mechanics. But now we have actually an increasingly amount of consumer-facing products uh, and services, and therefore we need to get to know our customers as best as we can. Uh, this is also important to note because it helps understanding what we expect in terms of business value from this cloud transformation. So everything we have developed in the past and put in place was based on real organic needs, and we are proud of the work we did. We, are, we implemented the best infrastructures and uh, built the best teams and organizations that we could at that time. In other words, the solution we adopted in the past were the best fit for that time. But as we noted earlier, we are an organization that prides itself on evolution and advancements. And while we are happy with the work we did, it's incumbent upon us to continue to understand new trends and adapt to new business needs. Which we'll get into. <laughs> so, like all corporations, uh, we must remain competitive on our ground. Protecting our trade secrets and making sure we comply with security standards and, and requirements, it's very important for us. So for now, we have decided that certain things, like industrial secrets, such, a, such as compound recipes for the tires, and critical systems, such as HR information, are best kept on our premises, where we know how to manage our highly custom system better on our own than on the cloud. But being a cloud-first company uh, means that maybe one day, in, in the coming future, we're going to migrate also that systems to the cloud. I had to put that in place, right? So, I mean, having said that, right, having said that there's still some on-prem, having said that, that you want to move to the cloud, that there's a lot of opportunity for innovation there, right? There's a lot of use cases where, where new potential can be unlocked thanks to the power of cloud services, and, and, and that's just not stuff on the cloud. It actually extends to new types of things like, you know, yeah. IoT and whatnot. So, little diversion. Uh, let's talk about the cloud. Now, there is a good chance that everybody in this room knows what the cloud is. If you don't, uh, we can do a little hallway session afterwards. I'll <laughs> tell you all about what the cloud is. Uh, but really what we got to get into here is how did Pirelli sort of start on this, right? How do we go, okay, we make tires and we have computers to we're a cloud-first company with an IoT ecosystem. Where did, where did that start? So we needed computing power and the freedom of allocating resources um, with the flexibility and comfort we never had before. So our development teams could not wait in line for a week waiting for a designated department to allocate the resources the standard way. Uh, it was necessary to have all the tools available uh, on demand, and AWS could just do the right job for us. 
as the digital products team, taking advantage of the cloud would enable us to worry on what was really important, uh, building our applications and unlocking, crea unlocking creative potential. At the same time, though, it was not easy for all our employees to cope with the change this technological shift was bringing with it. Um, we are a big company. We've been around for, for a while. Uh, change is an ongoing process, and it doesn't happen overnight for us. So, Roberto, you actually hit on a, an important phrase there, which is the idea of unlocking creative potential, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to come back to that theme a couple more times as we roll forward here. So when we realized the organization in the, the cloud was the way to go, um, we assembled a brand new team with stakeholders from both the B2C and the cloud architecture areas. And uh, this new team, the team I'm on, is called the Digital Innovation and Cloud Evolution. And it's part of the digital, uh, Pirelli Digital Group. Uh, our mandate is to explore new solutions and services uh, and adapt them to the real world examples. Uh, um, explore new solutions within the cloud universe, test new technologies, identify possible use cases, and help improving the way we build new products. Since we are embedded within the digital department, all of our exploration and findings are ba based on real world scenarios. Now, this is actually super important, and this is one of the first sort of key takeaways, is if you're in an organization that you know, is large, it moves slowly, it's been around for a while, it's, it's not a, you know, a modern startup tech company, uh, you want to innovate, you want to invent new things, you, you want to go in new directions, how do you do that? It can be difficult. And if you're gonna put together a team to do it with a name like that, it's a pretty enterprisey sounding name, it's perfectly acceptable, the important thing there is to not work in a silo, right? You have to That's be right. embedded with actual production teams, real world data, real world problems. That's the only way that you're gonna move forward. If you've got your innovation squad working in a, behind closed doors in some ivory tower, that's just a waste of time. Yeah. Honestly. So what was the first task that you had to go through? I mean, what was so, the first thing your team did? So our first task is, was to figure out what we we're gonna do with, those, with this old AWS thing. And it's speaking big, of our right? first approach to AWS, our way of moving things to the cloud was pretty standard. Uh, a very modern and conservative lift and shift paradigm. Uh, we were literally assessing every single one of the systems, uh, thinking, can we put this on an EC2 instance? Uh, do this database need to be on-prem? Do we need like, uh, to shift the components somewhere else? And whatever was considered suitable for our purposes after this assessment was lifted and shifted to the cloud. This exercise gave us, uh, gave us profound awareness um, and understanding of our existing systems and we were getting a first taste um, of the power of the cloud also. So the point is to show you that you don't need to go from sort of legacy on-prem to 100% serverless overnight. Although if you're capable of doing that, I'd really like to talk to you because that's Herculean. Uh, it's okay to go step by step, right? Every application, every product's gonna have its own life cycle, its own structure, you have to be assessed independently. Some of them fit more naturally than others with the cloud or with your understanding of the cloud, that's fine. Uh, but despite the apparent simplicity of this sort of first rollout, there were some important advantages. So let's go through a couple of those. Yeah, there was a number of obvious technical advantages, um, notably being able to activate and deactivate resources on demand. Uh, but the real story here is around organizational and business advantages. A notable example is around cost control. We could immediately see and understand exactly how and where we were spending our money. And AWS helped, that, helped us uh, throughout this process. Even as we were rolling this out, we were already exploring new avenues and discovering areas for improvement. This is critical. So one of those areas we identified fairly early on was uh, observability. We were, we, there was a lack in observability within our systems. And Pirelli is a large company, and responsibilities are distributed across many, thing, many teams and locales around the world. And um, as we were like, and much we, like we are experts on making tires, we realized that we needed to find someone who was an expert at, at observability, and that's when Datadog came into the picture. So let's talk a little bit about observability. Uh, very, very briefly before we get to the, the meat. In the industry, you talk about the three pillars of observability, so metrics, logs, traces, you've probably heard of this. Uh, those things haven't gone anywhere, but the fact of the matter is that in today's landscape of ever-increasing complexity, scale, scope, right? These three elements are necessary, but they're insufficient. Observability is, today is a lot more than just those three pillars. Like, how do you deal with events? How do you define an event? Uh, what do you do on, what's your mobile story, right? What's your IoT story? 
how can we make determinations about user experience, and not just code path errors, right? I mean, your hard drive's filling up. Great, who cares? How do containers play into this? What's the serverless landscape look like? You need a holistic, multi-dimensional way of navigating you know, through your stuff, right? Through your, through your applications, and especially with something as large as some of these architectural diagrams we're gonna dive into in a moment, mm -hmm. You need a solution that's going to help you to understand your business, not just your CPU usage. I probably figured this out. That's why they came to us. And actually, that's the last thing I'm going to say about Datadog. Thanks for listening. <laughs> so to give you an example of how observability and Datadog have been important for us, let me tell you a story. So we have this web service that is a major touch point with our customers. Uh, it's a tool that people use to understand which of our products, so tires, fits best on their cars. And one day, the, the marketing department raised a complaint about the dropout rate in the user journey for this service. And apparently, half of the people who started using the service wasn't getting to the end. 50% drop-off 50% right? drop-off. So that was really bad. Um, it took us a full week before Datadog to explore all possible reasons why this might be. We did all the classic things, such as SSHing into machines, grepping logs, dumping databases, and then, after a week of researching, we realized nothing was wrong. It was actually the analytics provider that was providing faulty data. What are you going to do about that, right? Fine, but it took yeah. us a week to figure that out. So fast forward a few months, and the same service was suffering the same problem. So this time, was, there was a difference. We were using Datadog. And because we had now had a much stronger observability story, we were able not only to determine the source of the issue, but to solve the problem in a single day. So it wasn't the analytics this time. There was an actual back-end problem causing severe latency to the whole system. So any sufficiently complex system, you, you know, it's going to be hard to debug, right? But it's not just about the tools. It's about the relationships, right? It's about having trusted partners. This is super important. And you need those trusted partners to help you make the most of the resources that you're putting into place. Yeah. So soon after, we realized we weren't making optimal use of the cloud. And our was a learning process, uh, also about ourselves. And we had new opportunities to create value for the organization. And as we were maturing into the technology, the technology was allowing us to mature. Um, one of the enablers of that feedback loop was our partnership with AWS and Datadog. Um, AWS, in one hand, uh, is helping us optimizing the way we use managed services and spending our money. Um, services like classic and application load balancer, EC2 reservations, for example. And the technical account manager is driving us through the optimization phase. Datadog, on the other hand, is giving us a level of awareness and understanding of how our services have, have been used and are being used by our customers and partners. So like, on the one hand, you have a partner that's going to teach you how to use or help you use the platform, AWS. On the other hand, you have a partner that's going to help you understand how people are using your platform. Yep. Right? That sort of uh, you know, mutually beneficial trifecta that leads into sort of the second phase here. Yeah. So we just want to go faster, exploring new opportunities. And as we do that, we realize that some of other departments within the company are not used to that type of speed. Uh, nobody's saying turn the engine off. Uh, we were working together to decide when to apply the brakes and when to accelerate. So being able to go, mark, to, go to market faster and safer for us still is our main goal. When you talk about moving quickly, it's really about reducing the fear of change, right? A uh, simple fact of the matter is that companies that implement faster release cycles have less of a chance of rolling back. You deploy smaller changes. Those smaller changes have less chance of inerrant behavior. Your system was more stable overall. You don't have to believe me. There's a lot of good science on it. Go read the state of DevOps report, right? It's all in there. Uh, so let's actually look at you know, a concrete example of what we're talking about yep. here. So in the first phase, as I said before, we were using a lift and shift approach. No containers, no serverless, nothing fancy. So in the second phase, we started looking at our applications and architectures and identifying exactly where containerization could work and ideally be a benefit for us. So we had some assessment criteria, but we also adopted a relatively conservative approach. Uh, we started by breaking down uh, systems into decoupled units starting by the consumer of the data, since we had a freer hand on the consumers that on data sources themselves. And this is not dissimilar to a microservice approach. Uh, but here again, um, we were doing it in parts, testing and verifying as we went. We were able to implement a new automation strategy for building and deploying our application an acceptable level of both speed and independence. So there's an interesting paradox here, right? So, so if we've increased freedom and the ability to just deploy 
whatever, whenever, there comes additional cost and oversight concerns. And I'm not just talking about, you know, does this make sense as a consuming resources, but with an organization like Pirelli, which is actually putting tires out onto the road, mm -hmm. right, we're also talking about regulatory concerns, you know, and, and where resources and costs are concerned, how do you deal with that? In the old way, there was breaks built into it, yeah. right? You had to wait for stuff to happen, and it gave you time to reflect. And in the new way, which is where you just get everything you need right away, the brakes are off. Yeah. How do you deal with that? So speaking of verifying and applying the brakes, we needed a way of uh, um, verifying the, the content of our Docker images. So the Docker ecosystem is full of solutions and software and basically everything. It's great for rapid prototyping, but for a company of our size and scope, we needed assurances before we went to production. We needed a way of verifying the content of Docker containers within our production environments, and we had to come up with some sort of way of verifying and authenticating in order to make a statement of trustworthiness uh, of Docker images that we were deploying in our systems. So we started by gathering images, base images from reliable sources, for example, the JDK, the official one, or the one supplied for Node.js. We then applied our customization and libraries, and we, at, at first we stood up our, our own Docker registry to host our images, but then we shifted to the ECR, since it's better to let it manage to AWS. And uh, that's all well and good, but containers were only part of the story of this transformation, the part where we still needed to manage our own infrastructures, and you probably can predict where I'm going with this. Could it be? Serverless? That's correct. <laughs> so serverless, let's talk about serverless, or functions as a service, or FAS. I've said that out loud, it sounds terrible. Let's not call it that. Uh, it's manifested in AWS through Lambda, right? Uh, if you're not using Lambda right now, if you haven't checked it out yet, it's actually super cool. So when you're done with your sessions today and you're opening your computer this evening, sitting down with a beverage, check serverless out. Lambda is super cool. But it does represent a different way of architecting systems, right? So brief divergence. What does it mean to architect for serverless? It means thinking about architecting for the smallest amount of work in the smallest amount of code, using the smallest amount of resources and the smallest amount of time, because time and resources are what you're paying for. Uh, you, you can't just take your monolithic stack and put it in Lambda. That's not how it works, right? So it raises a good question. Literally how can you figure out, how did Pirelli figure out? So we thought what could be we figured that out, but probably we make some mistakes initially. It's okay to admit that. Uh, for example, we re-implemented a backend service that, is, that fits this model of discrete and reuse, reusable uh, actions and um, predictable resource usage. So the problem was that in, that service wasn't called really often, and we had to mitigate the cold start effect. So we ended up building our Lambda warmer in order to, to let this work with good performance. So a Lambda that, get, that doesn't get cold in a while uh, takes some time to put an operating system in place. Mm -hmm. That's called the cold start effect. And uh, uh, an, applications, an application that before was running on the server now is running serverless and be, um, getting cold the first time it needs to warm up. Right, so it takes a little time there. But that was more yeah. like a Band-Aid, right, really in a lot of ways. Yeah. So this had another example of a good implementation of Lambda that we have done. So we have this web service that provided an API, uh, the primary activity of which was to trigger very complex database queries and correlate data and get back to the users. And we think APIs are a very good example to be fit in Lambda. So this is actually, this is the pro tip here for y'all. Uh, if you have an API, that's probably a good place to start looking if you're looking to go what do we, can, can we do serverless? Is that a thing we can do? Look at your APIs. There's a good chance there that you might be able to transition that over with a minimal amount of fuss. So again, pro tips. All right, all of that, we're talking about the necessary but insufficient. That was all necessary to understand the context, right? A little bit about yeah. the journey so far. How did Pearly go again from being a, a tire company to being all this good stuff we're about to talk about in the second section? So let's get uh, right to the interesting part of the presentation. Um, we have a few products. <laughs> not, the, not the first part wasn't interesting. <laughs> no, I'm All right, it was interesting. So as the world is craving for more and more, more digital instruments from consumer goods companies, we would like to share with you our interpretation of, uh, in, in terms of services built around our main product, tires. Here comes the IoT stuff. Yeah. <laughs> 
So track adrenaline, uh, we have these applications, uh, application that works with sensorized tires and a control unit that has very, very cool features to race on track. But let me show you a brief video before that. So this video is really cool. Are you ready for it? Actually, really, it's, well, it's a lot of fun. Hopefully it has sound. We're about to find out. So that's just the teaser video. If you actually go to Pearly's website, uh, they've got the, the full length one on there. It's actually a lot of fun to watch. It shows off some more features and whatnot. So definitely go check that out. Yeah. yeah. So with Track Adrenaline, uh, the consumer is able to uh, configure his sensorized tires with a mobile application and uh, with a control unit that is associated with the car he wants to race on track with. Oh, it could be he, it could be she, it could be they, right? Yeah. Anybody can use track adrenaline, it's fine. So, passionate sport car owners, we like to call them patrol heads. Petrol. Uh, petrol heads. Petrol heads. Yeah, so can take advantage of professional racing uh, telemetry system, can check the tire status, temperature, pressure, in order to get the best performance on track. From the tire sensorization that is performed in factory, taking advantage of services deployed within AWS uh, for the development of this application have been adopted a fully cloud strategy um, with a compound of discrete reusable components and microservices that fits naturally onto AWS. Mm. So to list some of the services that we are using, these are S3, Dynamo, Aurora, RDS, load balancers, API gateway, you name it. Got some yeah, Rope 53 using... in there, you got some SNS. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So these services are the building blocks of the whole application and are packaged, some of them are packaged in containers which get built and deployed automatically throughout the whole stack. Uh, the advantages of having systems architecture, architected in such a way, it, it enabled us to build resilient, loosely coupled and stable and scalable applications and the pattern uh, used for them is becoming a standard across all development teams in Pirelli. So why don't we take a look at that pattern? Yeah. All right, let's do it. This is the big scary slide, right? So, a lot of stuff on here. Uh, let's break this down, kind of everything from all this AW, sweet, sweet AWS stuff we've been talking about, all the way to that sweet, sweet tire stuff. Let's actually walk through this. So let's talk a bit uh, about system architecture here and technology around the product. So we have an in-factory uh, pairing process that can be seen at the top right that is using a design device uh, that writes information about tire uh, within the sensor, within the memory of the sensor, and the pairing process gets completed in that way. Uh, in addition, sensors that look pretty similar uh, for all Pirelli purposes uh, get configured with the wanted mode and frequency of broadcast. So we have different usages for the sensor. In this case, it's track adrenaline, this is a sport usage. So we have a special configuration for it. So the most complete configuration of Track Adrenaline uh, features uh, the tires with sensors mounted and a control unit, as well as the mobile application. Um, you might wonder what is a control unit. Uh, the control unit is a very small computer uh, that is running a very light version of Edison Linux. Uh, it has an Intel processor, a Wi-Fi uh, wi and Bluetooth module, a GPS module, SSD and RAM. So uh, it's a lot like kind of like a little Raspberry Pi or something you might have at home, yeah. right? It's, it's sort of stock configuration. It gets assembled. It gets put into a little plastic box to keep it, you know, secure from the elements. It's fundamentally not a lot different mm -hmm. from, from the sorts of mini computers, mini PCs you might have. It's in a your mini home. computer. Yeah, exactly. So it comes with a built in Wi Fi setting. Uh, you get it home and you configure your own Wi Fi. Uh, and once it's configured, it talks to the mobile app using dedicated Wi Fi socket. Um, the control unit job is to set the sensors up so it knows which one has to listen to and set them in race mode when necessary, as well as decoding the messages broadcasted by the sensors uh, to transmit them to the app, enabling very cool features such as live racing tips for the drivers and real-time uh, tire information. So 
So that's actually, I, I think it's actually kind of neat, right? This idea that, uh, you know, you can collect this information directly from your tire. Like, what's your tire actually doing? And, and that information helps you to be a better driver, right? That's actually pretty neat. And, and that's the stuff that was, at one point, I mean, that was the domain of Formula One racers and, and whatnot. But I think it's cool that this is starting to be democratized, right? This is starting to something that's coming out now to the consumer level, which is really neat. So you can have this system in different configurations. You can have just a control unit. You can have just the tires with the sensors, or you can have a combination of both. Uh, when the control unit is not present in the configuration, with just the sensors within tires, it is possible to take advantage just of the live information on the tire status, such as pressure, temperature, acceleration, uh, and other insights. And when the user chooses having only the control unit, but not the tires, uh, it is possible to take advantage just of the lap timer. The combination of both uh, gives you the racing tips, the possibility to record your sessions, the possibility to view your session through the portal and the mobile app. You can race against yourself. You can see your previous laps on track. And it's very, very cool feature. I, think. I, I actually yeah. really like this, because if you ever played like a racing game, you know, Need for Speed or whatever, one of the fun things you can do is, is, is race against your ghost. Right? And you go like, wow, this would be really cool if I could do this in real life. Now you can. Right? Uh, that's really neat. <laughs> I mean, that's cool. Another one of the interesting things here that was sort of tucked away in what you were saying was this idea that the pieces can work together, but they can also work separately. Yep. Right? Yeah, you know, the, the sensors can be used on their own, the control unit can be used on its own. And, and in this way, they can actually be a move you know, between vehicles, used for different purposes, yep. right? I, and I think that, that flexibility is actually kind of neat. So the control unit does not do everything on its own. Uh, we have a back-end system, a pretty standard microservice uh, architecture uh, built in AWS uh, that is doing all the hard work. So this back-end is a result of, comp uh, of a compound of discrete, discrete reusable components and microservices designed to fit into AWS. And it has uh, a few main uh, duties. Uh, providing the algorithms for calculating the racing tips uh, to the application. So the application is doing the calculation internally, getting the algorithms, algorithms from the back end. Another feature of the back end is storing the sessions so that they can be made available through the portal and the web app, and the mobile app, sorry. And uh, it also um, provides the API uh, that enable user to manage his own garage and, and the cars. Or her own garage, within the, their own garage. Their own garage, yeah. yeah. All right. So that's another sort of video game thing too, right? If you have video games and you're pressing the video game and you build your garage and whatnot, uh, turns out real human beings collect cars. <laughs> wow, what a concept. And, and this is enabling that as well, which is cool. Uh, so let's actually talk about one of the other pieces on this diagram we've got right here, which is, which is the mobile app. Now, when I think mobile app, uh, I, I think basically like a web view, right? Say, oh, it's a web view. It's just it's got an API. It's calling. It's explaining some things. But in fact, in this particular case, the mobile application is, is more than that, right? Yeah. So um, mobile application is a native iOS or Android application. Uh, it communicates with sensors using the Bluetooth protocol. It, communi it communicates with the control unit using uh, a Wi-Fi socket, um, as well as it sends session information and other information and retrieves um, using APIs with the back end. And same thing to the portal. Uh, the architecture of the back end is pretty standard. Uh, um, we have Docker containers. Uh, they, we, we host them into a rancher instance that um, help us managing in a more friendly way our containers. And we use a number of services uh, from AWS, such as Lambda for a few things, or uh, SES, SNS for notifications, and ECR for our Docker images. Right, and we'll, we'll actually dive into that a little bit more on some of the other slides. Yeah. Right? All right, cool. So that is sort of the first introduction to kind of where Pirelli is at in terms of going from, hey, we make tires, what's a computer, to, okay, we're actually a tech company now that just happens to make tires, right? And we're gonna see some similarities as we move forward through the next couple of diagrams, so we won't go necessarily to the same level of depth. Uh, but after all that tech talk, right, starting to feel like, okay, energy levels are dropping, you know, we just had lunch, we got the adrenaline, the adrenaline dump. So what better way 
than to watch another cool video yeah. to get those energy levels back up. All right, let's do it. Uh, here we go. <laughs> So a preview of replay tomorrow night. Yeah. <laughs> so another IoT cloud native system we are designing uh, is called Cyberfleet. Uh, it introduces some very cool features for truck and bus fleets, and let me show you uh, what these are uh, in the next slide. But uh, first, sorry, go, go back oh, one. Sure, yeah, we can go back. One. So the Cyberfleet technology solution is designed to serve uh, truck fleets and help managing tire pressure and temperature at any time. And it works as a digital gouge also, so it gives you immediate insights on the tire status uh, without the need of uh, waiting for the tires to cool down uh, prior to measuring. So it enhances business efficiency, uh, reporting anomalies and sharing awareness to drivers and fleet managers on tire status, uh, as well as uh, help optimizing uh, fuel consumption. So the solution is made available to regional and truck fleets, truck trailer companies, uh, bus and coach fleets, public companies, as well as truck side owners. So I think one of the cool things here, right, is that with the previous example, it was you know, about going fast, right? How do we go fast? How do we race? How do we sort of tap into that luxury market and uh, you know, make the cars go faster? And I hope safer, but mostly faster. And here's the same application of, of, the, of the technology with the sensors and, and so on and so forth but the aim of it is very different. And I think that's another really important takeaway uh, for any companies that are you know, trying to get into the IoT space, or maybe even are in the IoT space, is to try to think of different ways that that hardware can be used, right? What are some other different avenues? And you're not gonna be able to come up with those other different avenues if you're not willing to, to unlock that creative potential. Mm -hmm. And so you're thinking to yourself, like, why, why were we talking about all other stuff at the start when we just wanted to get to the cool IT stuff and the fun videos? That's why, right? The reason that Prilly's able to innovate and move into these new areas is because they eliminated the toil. It's because they said, no, it's fine. We figured the back end stuff out, right? We can now unleash our full creative potential in looking at new ways to, to move the company forward into, into new industries, right? Now I'm gonna press this button, it might try to play the video again. No, great, perfect. So I guess you start recognizing the pardon here. Uh, so the only part is missing out in here is the control unit that was present on Track Adrenaline that is not needed for Cyberfleet. Uh, all our applications are implemented, implemented following a framework of technologies carefully combined. Uh, it is. Um, there is no control unit, and the app communicates directly with sensors. Uh, it's a different system. Uh, sensors are very similar. The configuration is different, but the purposes are completely apart from each other. So here, although the sensors themselves are not uh, pictured, they mm -hmm. are in play, mm -hmm. right? And as you mentioned, the control unit's not there, and it's an example of sort of mixing and matching uh, that technology. Uh, taking a look then actually at the diagram, that we've got behind us. Uh, I'm actually curious about Rancher. Now, in all honesty, and this isn't just me saying this for the purposes of this talk, I actually did not know what Rancher was the first time I saw this diagram. Uh, I was like, what is, is, is cows in there? What's going on? Rancher. So for the benefit of those in the audience who maybe don't know what Rancher is, so well, Rancher is a tool that we use for managing containers. Uh, provides a very hand, um, handy UI uh, in order to, to set up your uh, stacks, mm -hmm. manage your containers, uh, run operations, uh, and uh, updates within your uh, container environments in a friendly way using a UI. Okay, well, that sounds pretty good yeah. then, right? So um, at the moment, it relies on uh, an orchestrator that is Cattle, that was his native one, mm -hmm. but we're gonna upgrade to the second version this year, and we're gonna shift to Kubernetes as soon as we can. Ah, Kubernetes, yep. everyone loves Kubernetes. <laughs> All right, next slide? Yeah. Let's do it. So uh, another product we are working on, um, another example of product is a cloud-native application called Cycle Around. Uh, Pirelli wants to play its part in sustainable mobility 
And what better than e-bikes would represent this universe? Uh, as the world gets ready to embrace an even more uh, sustainable lifestyle, Pirelli wants to provide, of course, its tires, uh, but also experiences delivered, uh, delivered to our customers in the form of guided chores, uh, fully supported by our digital solution, fully hosted on and deployed on AWS. All right, so the idea is you get on the bike, and the bike kind of tells you where to go, brings you to interesting stuff, right? And if I may project here for a moment, I'm thinking enhanced reality. That sounds safe. OK. <laughs> So Let's take a look at the, the architecture. By now, this starts to look familiar. Uh, we can recognize the pattern. As we said before, we try to have a, a standard across and among all our applications. They might be, there might be some difference in picking and choosing the services from AWS that we uh, use to compose these systems. Uh, but as we continue building these products, we almost have zero concerns on what the cloud architecture, architecture looks like anymore. Uh, we can concentrate on what's really important, that is coding, enabling developers to unleash their creative capability without consuming time uh, in designing anything else apart from their applications. So these architectures uh, were not designed by accident. They are the result of a fair amount of analysis and planning and working with our partners. They're not final. Uh, we are always looking for a way of improving uh, all our models. And the team that is, tasks, uh, with this, uh, that is tasked with this evolution is cost constantly working on it. That's another important takeaway, right, is, is not to be dogmatic about your architecture. This is a trap that you can fall into. Everything from you know, building systems to building devices, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you've got subject matter experts who, who've designed a thing, who put their blood, sweat, and tears into it, and they go, this is the thing, this thing is perfect. We will never touch it. That's a trap. You need to aim directly at that and blow it up. Right, uh, that, that sclerotic effect that can sometimes occur when you've built a thing, you need to deal with that. If you're not dealing with that, then, then you're probably not innovating. So a team is responsible for being thinker of imagining what's possible and counterbalance on what's realistic. The temper the desire of doing new things while running a 146 years old company, a global prestige brand, is not easy. So the product of this collaboration is a set of, uh, a set of approved tools and procedures on which it is possible to build compliant applications. And the guide rails are there to keep us safe, not to stop us or slow us down, uh, but to make sure we can move quickly and safely. Actually, generating useful artifacts, example templates, uh, approved Docker images from secure sources, using deployment pipelines and tooling from linting static, uh, code static analysis or from the security perspective. Not just writing Word docs, we are engineers right. building engineering solutions. Not just you know, some ivory tower architect uh, handing down markdown from on high, right? Uh, <laughs> that's super, super critical. And the reason I put this little picture of, of the people shaking hands here uh, was to illustrate this idea that the other important component there is communication, right? Uh, it, you know, if you're a, a mobile developer over here writing the, the, the app, or if you're a back-end you know, engineer over here deploying AWS resources, or you know, you're literally uh, a hardware engineer you know, soldering the sensors together on the floor, you all got to be talking to each other. If there are silos, if there are walls, if there are no natural uh, mechanisms for communication between these teams, then you, there's just going to be a much harder time moving that forward, making sure everybody's on step. And that was one of the keys to success, really, mm -hmm. for Pirelli, was, was yep. fostering that communication. Also. Just from like a purely personal note, like if you're a mobile developer, sometimes it's really fun to go to a factory and see how tires get made, right? Like that's actually kind of cool, right? And that opens up those opportunities. And, and that was, again, I don't know, one of those takeaways that I want to make sure everybody's got, right? Yeah, but as you said, having all competencies around one project, like um, there is a very, very uh, um, good collaboration between these kind of products. You need to understand stuff that is not necessary your, your domain. So it's very interesting working on this. Cool. So some of the things we are going to work on next year is, uh, main, are mainly driven by security and infrastructural cost optimization. Um, as an organization, Pirelli always, uh, I've always been working on a single AWS account. Um, next year is going to be different, uh, different. We're going to have at least 20 accounts to be managed. Uh, we're partnering with AWS to ensure our future work is backed up following as best as we can their best practices, 
uh, optimizing usage as well as doing the right thing. And uh, as the knowledge of the product is maturing um, and our understanding of the AWS universe gets better, uh, we will work together to design and set up a secure multi-account environment based uh, structure, taking advantage of AWS landing zone, um, so the, the landing zone solution, and we will work on automating the setup of security compliant environments with the aim of uh, reducing human mistakes, as well as enforcing policies throughout all the AWS accounts. Uh, we're gonna work intensively on IAM to ensure all accesses to resources uh, are role-based and passwords and keys are not stored anyway. So pro tip, do not hard code your passwords. <laughs> if you take nothing else away from this, do not commit your passwords to GitHub. You're gonna have a bad time. All right. So that's it for us. Uh, honestly, thank you so much for coming out. Super appreciate it. Very, very quickly, if you sat on one of these, do please take a look at it. We've got a little QR code in here. We're giving away phones every day. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we have actually an experience booth here at the Aria where you can like, learn a little bit about Datatog. You take a little quiz. If you win the quiz, we'll hand you a Nintendo Switch. We're giving them away every 15 minutes. So if you want a Nintendo Switch, you got a pretty good shot at it. In any case, uh, that's it for me. Once again, my name's Daniel. Thanks for coming out. Thank you very much for attending. Roberto again. <laughs> uh, is Pearly hiring? Uh, probably, probably in the future. Yeah. Maybe you want to move to Milan. It's a pretty cool city, right? <laughs> OK. Right. Oh, no, wait, before I go. We got another big booth at the Venetian. If you haven't been to the Venetian uh, trade show floor yet, just walk through the door. And if you don't see our booth, it's because something's happened to your vision and you should see a doctor. But please come through. I'm going to be there this afternoon if you want to come talk about any of this or about monitoring or whatever. Thanks again, everybody. Cheers. Thank Have you. Have a good one. Bye-bye.